Good afternoon and welcome to the seventh of our eArmor digital sessions. I'm Niall, the eArmor communications officer, and I'll be the web host for this uh, session today. So I just want to outline at the beginning here how you can participate in the session. We would encourage you to do so as often as you can. Um, so in Zoom here, if you're familiar with it, uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see a black bar. And on the black bar, there are a number of labels uh, one of which is Q&A, and that's the area where you can ask questions. And, um, and during the session, um, Nick, uh, who will be the moderator here today, and myself, web host, will be going through the questions and we'll be able to put them to the speakers for you as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the host, and that is Nick Classen, and he is the um, Managing Director for eArmor. So over to you, Nick. Okay. Please, take it away. Yeah, sorry for that. Indeed, as Nyla said already, the seventh and um, the uh, yeah the, the seventh of eight sessions that we will be having in our digital sessions. These digital sessions uh, we have put on obviously because of the situation and that we can't be in also at this moment because today would be the final day um, of uh, of our conference. Um, we have moved it to September, but are putting on now these digital sessions and we're very ha happy that Jakob and Lachlan will be joining us uh, today for the session why research administrators should qu care about equality, diversity um, and inclusion. So uh, thank you very much uh, Jakob and Lachlan uh, for joining us. I also want to say that um, IARMA in the broader context has a lot of um, a lot of attention for uh, ethics, integrity, research ethics and integrity, everything that goes around that for research managers and administrators. It is also, um, there is um, a uh, module on gender um, and diversity within our certificate in research management. So that's our training program that we have from the very be uh, beginning. So now uh, five, six years ago, we started that up. We also have a, an early stage research administrator masterclass where there's quite some attention for um, ethics uh, and integrity. So a very important thing. I can also say that towards future planning and in our implementation plan of the current strategy, we are foreseeing uh, policies in uh, equality, in sustainability, uh, in diversity. So that's that's some of the things that are coming uh, up today. Um, I don't take much time to introduce uh, Jakob and Lachlan. Um, you can see their bios also um, on the website. They both have an RMA or RMA-like uh, past, if you will. Um, uh, um, Jakob has that uh, with the Aarhus University and Lachlan with um, a University of Warwick. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I'd like to uh, give the word uh, to uh, Jakob, who is uh, the, direc the dir director of um, Diversity Unity and Lachlan, who is uh, the director of uh, Cloud Chamber. So guys, take it away and thank you. Cheers, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thanks for the welcome. Um, as Nick has said, I'm Lachlan Smith. I'm a director of a company called Cloud Chamber. We're a UK-based research and evaluation uh, company. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, I'll let Jakob introduce himself as well. Yes, hello, my name is Jakob and I'm the director of Diversity Unity, a small consultancy here in Denmark. And uh, as Nick said before, I've been working in research administration here at Aarhus University in Denmark. And uh, during my time in the research support office there, I was part of the first cohort of the IAMA CRM. Later, I moved to a, another unit working with internationalization and talent de development of the uh, researchers until I uh, started this and we'll talk to you today about some of the stuff we uh, we do together. Great, thanks Jakob. So as I said, I'm Lachlan Smith, I'm with Cloud Chamber and as a consultancy we work with universities and now more and more with research funders here in the UK. So for those who are familiar with the UK funding landscape, we work with organisations like the Royal Society, the British Academy, ESRC and the Department for International Development and we, we support them in working with them to look at uh, the impact of their research as, as well as of helping them to evaluate their research programs. And one thing that's emerged I guess over the last couple of years is the, the funders are taking more of an interest in uh, questions of diversity, questions around who's applying for their programs, which institutions are applying 
uh, what are the barriers that might be in place that stop people from applying and how how their programs and, and research grants are structured and what impact that might have on, on the people who are applying. And, and once they actually get the grant, what's ha what happens to them. So we've started doing more work with them around that over the last couple of years. Jacob and I met in Edinburgh at iNorms a couple of years ago, two to two and a half years ago, I think, uh, where Jacob was doing a presentation on, on cultural intelligence and international uh, internationalization within the higher education uh, sector and we, and we started chatting from then and started to realize that there was a emerging uh, gap I guess around uh, diversity and inclusion and equality within international research partnerships so we wanted to have a look at that in a bit more detail and we it got us thinking that actually what makes these international research partnerships work beyond uh, sort of interdisciplinarity and uh, making sure you're working with people that you know and etc cetera, etc cetera. On the back of this, I did a talk at ARMS in Adelaide last year, looking at LGBT researchers in international uh, contexts. Uh, and since then, we've been exploring more and more how research management actually fits into this and what research managers and administrators can do to support diversity in their own research environments and their own teams, but also for academics that they work with as well. So that kind of brings us to where we are today and this, this webinar. Uh, Jacob and I originally developed this as a face-to-face -face workshop and then COVID-19 turned up and all plans changed and we've spent some time rewriting uh, the material to try and make it work for an online audience. Originally this is going to be an all-day workshop so we're condensing an all-day workshop into sort of 45-50 minutes so there will be certain things that we're going to skim over pretty quickly, there'll be some things that will be left out uh, but there'll be plenty of opportunity to hopefully ask some questions and have follow-up as well on the back of that, and hopefully it's of interest. So in terms of what we want to talk to you about today, as the title says, uh, we want to talk about what diversity is and, and why sh you should care as people who work in research management and administration. Uh, we want to spend a bit of time talking about the relationship between diversity, identity and culture and what that might mean before moving on to looking at cultural intelligence. And a lot of the work that we've done to date together has been focused on cultural intelligence uh, and how that can be used within an international research environment. From that, we'll have a bit of a chat around biases and stereotypes, which are often at the heart of uh, problems around diversity and inclusion in international environments, before we take a, a particularly focused look at LGBT uh, people, uh, their experiences uh, and what's at stake for them within this environment and we'll analyze that through a lens of culture and dignity as well and right at the end we'll, we'll spend a few minutes talking about some tips and tricks and things for you to think about both personally in terms of how you approach diversity uh, within your own organization but also uh, some specific questions you might want to take back to your to your research group, your research uh, office, to think about research diversity and inclusion in the future. As Nick and Niall have both said, you know, we're happy to take questions as we go through and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, and if we don't get to answer them all um, by the end, then we're more than happy to have some follow up uh, via email and you'd be welcome to contact us as well. So I'll hand over to, to Jacob to pick up on what is diversity and why you should care. Okay. Let's go from here. Um, so normally when we talk about uh, diversity in a research uh, context, it's often uh, a question of more women in research. And that is of course important, but diversity is more than that. Uh, so when we talk about diversity in this context, we're talking about all the parameters such as gender, ethnicity, race, social class, sexual orientation, religion, physical ability, and cultural background. Now, we can of course not say anything what, about what it's like to be a black woman in research. What we can talk about and will be our point of departure is our own backgrounds as openly gay men in research and research administration but that is just an example so keep in mind that this could be all of these things 
And as you can see here, it's not all of these parameters are necessarily visible. Uh, some are, of course, some are not. And that is why it's so important that you are open and vocal about your approach to uh, diversity, because you simply don't know your audience. And if you, uh, if you are uh, diverse in one way or the other, part of minority, and that isn't seen, and you haven't heard the approach, you might hide instead. And it's also important to say that this is not only a question of being allowed to be there. This is a, a question of being allowed to be yourself and be given dignity by everybody recognizing that you have worth simply by who you are, acknowledging that you have a background that is unique and can bring a new perspective and everybody else gives space to make your contribution be heard. This sounds simple, it sounds banal, but if it was as easy as that, everybody would do it. And as such, it is, uh, it's an important to, a tool to build community and improve a sense of belonging for everybody. Uh, because the more you can be yourself, the more you can contribute to the group and in that sense you enhance the commitment and the performance of everybody. It ensures that universities can maintain their relevance in today's changing society and world that is getting smaller, demographics are changing and in that sense it increases their societal impact by having everybody represented. It's also the only way to get the best talent. Uh, talent, of course, follow uh, demographics, and we can't afford not to get the absolute best talent doing research, uh, no matter their background, and we need them to feel welcome and feel good in their own skin in order to perform at their very best. Uh, a few examples for that is more specific about research management and research. There's a bibliometric analysis that found that uh, scientific papers uh, with a more uh, ethnically mixed groups of group of authors were more likely to be to be in higher impact journals and gain five to ten percent more citations, leaving the whole discussion of bibliometrics and impact and citations aside. So, but these are numbers that most managers would understand and uh, convince people. It's also a simple question of we have, we're facing more, so we're, there's more talk about uh, societal challenges in research funding and global uh, challenges and threats like COVID uh, and uh, climate change. And of course, this requires international collaboration. And just as we all know that interdisciplinarity is the challenge, so of course is international collaboration and it should be talked about if we want societal challenges to be more than a buzzword. A final thing is that several studies have shown that just the pres presence of someone with a diff from a different uh, identity group uh, makes everybody else generate more ideas, just having the added perspective. And you also feel that you have to construct more complex arguments uh, in order to persuade everybody else. And in that sense, you will, be, you will develop more innovative and better argued uh, research from having uh, more diversity uh, in your research groups. Lachlan, do you have anything to add to this? I guess another way to, to think about it, and some of you might be aware of the work of Matthew Said, who's based here in the UK, who talks about cognitive diversity as well as um, uh, diversity in the sense we're talking about, but there's a, there's a considerable overlap and he acknowledges this between the two, that getting people from different backgrounds with different experiences and different angles and different perspectives on the world will give uh, different ways of thinking about problems and bringing them together adds to interdisciplinarity. It's not just about the discipline, but it's about the different perspectives that people can bring. So cognitive diversity is another element to that. So next slide. Here we want to talk a little bit about diversity and identity. And you know, we're, most of us are aware that identity is a, a social construct and depending on the situation in which we find ourselves in, 
we may show different parts of our identity. We may reveal them, we may emphasize them, uh, depending on who we're with, whether it's a work environment, whether it's a research environment, whether it's with our friends or family or at a sporting club or out to dinner, whatever it might be, you know, that it'll be very, very different. We're all part of different cultures and groups. And obviously the, the, the audience that we're talking to today comes from a range of different cultures across Europe and possibly beyond. And, and different inputs and changes across culture over time make our identities dynamic and our own identities will change as we go through life, as we go through work, uh, as we change positions, as we learn more. Uh, and it's important to, to sort of remember that. And it's also important to remember that being belonging to a culture is, 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 is something that we all are part of and it lends meaning to our actions and it forms our ways of, of thinking and acting. What, what we really want though is, a, and it's a general human trait to, to look for acceptance and the ability to make ourselves understood and to make a constructive contribution to results within our community. And that obviously is community in its broadest sense and we're looking at work as well. But it also goes slightly beyond respect for our contributions. And as Jacob alluded to in the last slide, it's about uh, you know, recognizing uh, the dignity in who we are and, and, and we all want that. Membership of a group, membership of a culture, membership of an identity it means to feel in and it's to feel right and comfortable and validated about who you are. And cultural communities uh, lens group identity. So it will contribute to members' personal identities through shared language, behavior, and self perceptions. But before we talk a little bit about some of the dangers, there's just a few points I want to add um, to all of that. One is that sometimes we can get trapped by looking at single attribution correlations so by that i mean you might see that somebody's from an ethnic minority or somebody might be gay or somebody's a particular age or somebody's a man or woman or whatever it might be uh, and and i think if we focus too much on that we effectively obscure richer stories um, and bringing intersectionality into it and understanding people as a whole is a much stronger way of of understanding them uh, understanding their culture but also getting the best out of them in a work environment. No single person can represent an identity or group. Um, it is a very much a, a collective thing and you'll draw it from other people and you'll also feed that back into the group that you're part of. But one interesting thing that, that you know, is, is both interesting yet maybe slightly terrifying, but we're probably all used to it, is that Google probably knows your identity attributes from the searches you make, the, the types of questions you ask, and things like that. So we know that our identities will influence what we value, what we spend our time on. Uh, and, and as an extension of that, the sort of problems we're interested in, the sorts of things that we want to find out more about, the problems that we want to solve. So to solve the most relevant societal problems, we need to get angles. Um, well, we need to get a variety of angles and different perspectives in order to do that. So that's where diverse teams starts to come into it, bringing those cultures, bringing those identities. This will, this will only change and continue to change. The focus now on a lot of research funding is on uh, societal and global challenges. And Jacob's already talked about COVID-19 being one of them, but there's obviously others uh, which, which will continue uh, were around pre-COVID and will be around post-COVID or maybe changed post-COVID. So these global demographics are changing, the geopolitics is changing, and these challenges are always changing. So always being mindful of who you've got around the table, who's part of the conversation, and who's part of your research group is incredibly important. But there are two dangers. One is the mere exposure effect. effect. So essentially our brain rewards us with a nice warm feeling when we're in familiar surroundings. You know, we, we wanna hear stuff that, that we like, you know, we're, here's stuff that we're used to, we want to associate with people that we're used to. Alongside of this is we tend to project similarity onto other people, so we might, or other cultures, we might believe we have more in common with people from other cultures than we actually have, and, and it's an assumption that's very easily made uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and we all do it in, in all of our work. To help tackle some of this, we, we want to start looking at the issue of cultural intelligence and how that fits into it. And I'll hand back to, to Jacob. And Jacob, if you have anything else to add, please do. Yes. Um, no, I think we'll just uh, 
try and uh, move uh, on to culture and cultural uh, intelligence. And as we talked about, cultural intelligence is uh, a core concept of how we work with this and we take the term or the definitions on, on this slide from the book, Cultural Intelligence by Elizabeth Plum. It's highly recommendable uh, if you're interested in, in, in this. So when talking about culture, the definition here says that culture um, is a filter through which we interpret our existence and orient ourselves in order to direct our actions. Culture is not a thing, but a community which is generated and maintained and which is subject to gradual change in response to our mutual communication. So what does that mean? It means that culture is a construct uh, it is something we perform together depending on uh, which context we are part of because we have multiple identities and depending on the group we are part on, different cultural aspects uh, play a large or smaller role. So culture is what is normal. It is the expectations to how to behave and the norms uh, uh, that we uh, we consider uh, we consider uh, when uh, going through our daily life. A easy example is Christmas Eve. As a Dane, I would consider is uh, it perfectly normal Christmas Eve that we bring a tree into the living room, we decorate it, and after dinner we would all uh, grab each other's hands and we would walk around it and sing Christmas carols. Uh, as a Dane, that seems perfectly normal. Everybody else seeing it from the outside would probably, probably think that we were batshit crazy. But that is the cultural norms that is the most important in that uh, situation. Cultural intelligence uh, is, the definition here says that it is the ability to act appropriately in situations where cultural differences are important and the ability to make yourself understood and to establish a constructive partnership across cultural differences. So what that means is that this is not only about coping and surviving in, in a situation where people are behaving differently from yourself or mocking behavior from everybody else. It is a question of engagement and interest in actually making this work and respecting that everybody is different. It is a question of understanding, but not only understanding everybody else's culture, but also examine your own culture uh, because only then you can know what is norms, what is important, what is not important to you and see where to actually understand where you differ and uh, finally communicating these things and finding somewhere uh, something else that is, um, 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 that is a shared culture uh, that goes beyond uh, one or the, uh, the other. And then there is the um, final thing here. And oops, I was trying to, because I can't read it because of the pictures of everybody, unless I do like this, cheers. Uh, cultural intelligence is judged on the results of the encounter, not on the participants intentions or thoughts. An intelligent result of a cross-cultural encounter is the creation of a shared understanding across all the participant cultures and understanding which will enable the parties to get on with their work. And that was part of the uh, things I was, um, I was talking about. And this is important because we all have good intentions when we move into this. I very few would go into a research project with other people thinking, oh, I'm going to be a racist shit or a bigot or a homophobe uh, in, in, in this. But that's not good enough. We actually have to act accordingly. Um, one of the, an example in, about this, in when we look at the LGBT world, could be um, if I asked everybody who here, if... Um, if I showed up tomorrow, I was your colleague, showed up tomorrow at work in my suit as usual and a pair of red stilettos, what would you think? Most of you would say that you would consider it uh, unprofessional, which is obviously not true. 
me wearing stilettos doesn't make me uh, any less professional. And looking at how most men dress, my stilettos would probably be more stylish and more expensive than the shoes they were wearing. The problem, of course, is that according to cultural norms, men's, men don't wear stilettos. So in that sense, the problem is that I am not normal. And that is, and if you if we cover our cultural norms of what is normal with professional, then suddenly we show the people who uh, are diverse in one way or the other, in this case by not following the, the gender norms, that we, they are not normal. We, and we don't like that they are normal. And that is, in, in essence, a cultural encounter gone wrong. Lachlan, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, no, that's fantastic. I, I, one of the things that I've learned over the last two and a half years since Jacob and I met is the differences between Danish culture and British slash Australian culture. I, I grew up in Australia, for those who don't know, but I've lived in Britain for uh, 20 odd years now. Uh, the, the, Jacob's much more blunt and comes up with much more brazen examples than uh, the reserved British culture. Uh, would, would tend to do but uh, so that's been a fascinating uh, learning curve just for me myself in our working relationship for well, the next slide so let's let's throw biases and stereotypes into the into the mix so we've got cultural intelligence we've, we've got trying to understand culture and identity well, what happens when you throw biases and stereotypes into the into the mix I, i'm sure you're you're probably all absolutely aware that we are all implicitly biased in one way or another and and this certainly applies within uh, universities as well you know there's there's certainly a focus on gender and on gender representation and women in research uh, particularly within stem but not just in stem uh, but it goes it goes much further than that you know it looks at questions of hiring practices promotion grants publication patterns you know we know right now in in the world of covid 19 that there's anecdotal evidence suggesting that uh, primary carers who are often women are finding it much more difficult to continue doing uh, the work that they would have been doing. Uh, so some of these things are extrapolated and become more and more challenging. So it's really, really important to try and understand uh, biases and biases that you have. And, and, and some of these can be cultural things. Some of them can be taught. Some of them can be learned. For example, you know, if, if we're walking down the street one evening and you see three men running towards you with a knife and screaming at you you're probably going to turn around and run and that would be a perfectly rational reaction but if you took that learning and applied that to every situation where you saw another man in a meeting room it, it would become incredibly problematic so it's about understanding where your biases come from and what they trigger within you and how you apply them to different different situations so stereotypes are never neutral and they and they form our relationships uh, with with other people. Um, we can be quite quick to react and make judgments because our brains are wired that way. Um, snap judgments are a part of life and not just at work. Psychologists call this system one thinking where you, you make that instantaneous judgment and reaction based on the information presented in front of you, but it's reconfirmed by confirmation bias or information that you've gathered from the past. These will reinforce the preconceptions and, and it may go further than that. And it may actually be about social pressures as well to conform with in groups and to discount the opinions of outsiders. It's not always easy to disentangle yourself from that in a peer pressure situation. Sometimes it might be growing up in a monocultural society. And Jacob uses this example of growing up in Denmark, which is very much a monocultural society. Uh, this isn't to excuse an under, uh, a lack of understanding or, or any racism, but it's making it clear that sometimes it's about knowledge uh, and it might be that the fact that people aren't necessarily evil or bad people, it's just they don't have the knowledge and exposure and have been taught about cultural intelligence and biases and stereotypes. So they can be overcome, you know, biases can be overcome. It can be a deliberate process that you go through yourself to think about it. It can be about education and knowledge, but problems occur when we're blind to our own biases or insist that they don't exist. Or worst case, I guess, is if you acknowledge a bias, but you just ignore it and you keep moving on. So we need to 
all have a look at that and all look at our own uh, stereotypes and biases that, that we use. And we need everybody to call them out, including uh, people in minority groups, but including people who are not in minority groups. We need clear, visible allies in all situations to call out unequal treatment and suggest improvements for procedures and things like that. So stereotypes, as it says on the slide, you know, reflect more on ourselves and our views than the reality of the other person. And you tend to focus on negative features in other cultures in order to promote positive features in your own culture. And again, some, a lot of this stuff will be happening uh, at a subconscious level and you have to consciously stop and think about it in order to address it. They can create conflicts, uh, stereotypes, and they can block opportunities to resolve uh, to resolve conflicts. You know, we're aware there's different national cultures and they don't necessarily have a common set of standards, common language for conflict resolution and things like that. So that's where cultural intelligence, which Jacob was just talking about, comes into its own. Implicit biases within society can have a detrimental effect on, on individuals as well. So if you're in a minority group, uh, and people make assumptions about you, have stereotypes about you, and, and Jacob sort of re referred to some of that in previous slides, it can actually lead to yourself having a sense of shortcoming, it can lead to a lack of agency, it can lead to shame, and perhaps an often underperformance, and so you're not going to get the best out of staff if you've got people in your own team or in research environments who don't feel comfortable with who they are or feel like uh, biases and stereotypes are being used against them, even if not maliciously, sometimes unconsciously. The more aware we are of them, the better we will be at keeping an open mind and making sure that our biases can be modified by experiences. So an, an, an example that might be useful to think about, you know, if you, if you think of somebody entering academia and somebody who wants to become a professor, it, it's, it's been looked at as sort of a suggestion, there's probably about 10 hurdles, 10 steps you need to go through, promotions, achieving papers, grants, etc., etc., to get to that point of being successful. But for most people, they have about a 50% chance of success at each of those steps. So once you try and get through that whole process, there's about a one in a thousand chance of you passing all 10. If there is any bias against you though, even if it's a small bias, it might be a 10% kind of bias, you'd have a 40% chance at each step and suddenly you have a one in 10,000 chance of getting all the way through to professorship. So what might look like a pretty small scale of discrimination can actually result in quite a significant change uh, in the in the uh, makeup of the research team or the research environment. So how do you actually tackle stereotypes? It's about uh, knowledge and having knowledge, uh, challenging yourself and challenging others around you. And that's really, really important. When you're in a situation where you know uh, a stereotype is coming into play or a bias is coming into play, you know, don't react immediately to those situations and challenges. Step back and assess the position you're in and cultural intelligence can to make play a really important part in helping you to address those biases and stereotypes within your team or within your international collaboration. Uh, and over to Jacob unless you have anything else to add. Nope. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about some gay stuff now. Um, LGBTQ plus people have experienced discrimination and stereotypes for many years, and we still do uh, uh, to a different uh, degree, uh, depending on where uh, we live. And despite all the progress in, in many countries around the world regarding rights and equalities, many community members are still not uh, out at work, even in progressive countries in, in Western Europe. Uh, statistics show that it might be as many as 20 to 25% who are not uh, out. And there could be different reasons for that. They might not feel comfortable about this. They don't want to be pitied. They want to be measured only by their professional merits. Uh, uh, so, but it could also be a question of them not feeling that there is an open culture 
at uh, work and they can't be out. And to that extent, you simply don't get the most of these um, employees. And we should say that, I mean, we are white cisgendered men, both of us. And cisgendered, if people don't know cisgender, is just that you identify with the sex that you were born with. So I was born a man and I identify as a man. Uh, that is probably the easiest combination in the uh, LGBTQ plus uh, group to have. We have plenty of privilege, Lachlan and I, so don't pity us. Uh, so if by every, every example we are going to sh uh, give you here, consider if you added gay and of color or in a living in a country where being gay wasn't culturally uh, accepted or perhaps even illegal. And people often say, when you're living here in, in Denmark at least, oh, why is it so important? It's so easy for you, you have equality, et cetera, et cetera. But being gay still requires you to have a lot of strategies on a day-to-day -day basis. For one is how do you tell colleagues about your sexual orientation and gender identity? And again, some people might say, why would you? Uh, we don't care. No, but you might. So those of you are straight, how many of you have a plan for how to telling your straight in your CV when applying for a job. Probably none of you, but I have for telling that I'm gay because I don't want to work at a place where me being gay is a problem. So I had to, from the beginning, find a way of showing that I'm gay so that we didn't suddenly end up in a situation that was uncomfortable for everybody. If they didn't want me, they can they know from the beginning and then can just not invite me to the interview. But still, when you are employed somewhere, you are, it's often another question is, uh, when did you come out? The case is you're coming out every day. Coming out is a continuous process every time you meet someone new at work, in a project meeting, at a conference, you, every time you're, you're coming out over and over again. So how do you tell your colleagues? Also because if they don't know, suddenly someone is telling a joke, uh, putting in a pun, uh, uh, giving a, co a comment uh, uh, that unintended, then when you uh, tell them you're gay, it's all awkward and excuses and pff, I didn't mean that, no one understand. And sometimes it's just easier to get it out there in order to avoid all these situations. But also if you're in a, uh, in a research project and it's a global project and suddenly you have a project meeting in a country where being gay is illegal, what do you do? Uh, who's going to advise you about this? Also, some universities in Europe are having satellites in the Middle East or in the Far East where being gay is not culturally accepted. Who's going to advise them on how, how to handle that if they are supposed to go there? Um, another thing is when you sit around at lunch talking about family, chatting about your weekend, what did you do? You want to be part of that. You want to tell that. And luckily, most times that's quite easy and not a problem. But let's say now that I'm in, and this is, I'm, this is stereotypical, and I'm sorry about that, but take it for the illustration of it. Let's say that I'm an engineer, uh, 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 a postdoc at engineering, at an engineering department, and we just recruited two associate professors from Iran. That's, that's not, that could easily happen. The problem of course is that in, in Iran, people like me are people you hang. So when we're sitting at lunch, who makes sure that everybody is feeling comfortable? Is that my responsibility, their responsibility, everybody's management's responsibility? There is a certain, often a certain naivety about these uh, things that makes people hide or feel uncomfortable, and then we're back at people not performing at their best. A, an important term here is straight acting uh, or passing. Um, and both Lachlan and I have, have a shared experience here that often when we have told people that we were gay, uh, people have said, oh, uh, I hadn't uh, thought that, I hadn't guessed that. 
um, in my case, I'm, I'm pretty sure that often they were just being polite because often I'm as gay as a picnic basket. So, but uh, I thank you for that. Uh, those of you who who were kind enough to say so, but but still. And often you would wear it like, or I did at least wear it like a badge of honor that I could pass for a straight person because it simply makes things a lot easier often. The problem of course is that you only, it is often an act, it is a compromise. And how healthy is it? How much should you compromise with being yourself in order to fit in? And what are the consequences for your uh, mental well-being? That is perhaps one of the reasons that when you look at the statistics on uh, addiction, no matter whether it's alcohol, drugs, uh, sex, uh, and statistics on depression, uh, suicide, anxiety, etc., uh, LGBTQ plus people generally score uh, terribly high on, on those. Another thing to consider is that not everybody wants to be out, as I said earlier, but some have no choice. If you are the stereotypical flamboyant, loud gay man, every will, everybody will know the minute you step into the room. Or if you are um, uh, non-binary, so you don't identify as man, man or woman, and perhaps, the, perhaps dress accordingly uh, somewhere in between, or if you're a trans person transitioning and everybody can see that something is going on and nobody knows exactly what, then you don't have uh, a choice. And the problem there, of course, in, is that in that situation, they have absolutely no control of the situation or the reactions that people will have in that situation. So even if it is obvious, it is a question of giving people as much space as they can and possibly let them do it in, a, in as controlled a way as, as a, they can. But for the rest of us who have the church, you should also know that you can often have a feel like a, a pressure, it feels like a pressure to say something, to own up to the situation. Because if you don't do, you have the feeling that, am I, am I ashamed of being me? And I'm not. I'm a proud gay man and I have absolutely nothing to hide. But so sometimes when you, people think, oh, why are you talking about this and saying that? Well, perhaps it's just a fact of people wanting to uh, to be proud of of um, of who they are um, and as we talked about earlier not all differences are visible and as i said this is why you have to be very vocal about your uh, diversity uh, strategy and one of the things that is much talked about at the moment and you could consider is uh, the question of pronouns uh, would you like to be referred to as he, she, they, um, depending how you uh, identify often uh, with your gender identification. It is often a bit ridiculed uh, and talked about as a question of political correctness or identity politics. And I would say I, it's not. This is not a question of political, political correctness. It's simply of a question of you not being asked to people who are already struggling on multiple fronts. So a last concept to cover uh, that is important here is what is called performative progressiveness, which is when you accept queer LGBT people on the terms of the cisgender heterosexual majority. What that means is that you accept people being gay as long as they don't do gay. I mean, it's okay, you can get married, but, but please don't kiss each other in, in public or holding hands, or as we talked about earlier, come to work as a, a gay man in, in, in red stilettos, because then it suddenly becomes very, very obvious and then, it's, then, it's, then we're back at, 
we talk about diversity and on paper you might have diversity but you don't really want it and people are hiding they are straight acting and then you don't harvest the benefits of the uh, diversity that you have on paper Lachlan? No, that's great. Thank you, Jacob. So we've, we've talked a lot about different concepts, culture and identity and biases and stereotypes and cultural intelligence. And we've, we've given some examples of the LGBT community and how they may uh, feel and respond and act in research environments, uh, both in research management, but also research partnerships and some of the challenges there. But we wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about some tips and tricks and tools. Um, and, and a lot of these, are, they either overlap or they are about the way you approach a situation, uh, your thinking, um, how you react in situations and things like that. So first of all, and, and, and it's not easy, is just turn off your autopilot when you go into position, in, into different situations. You know, if you meet somebody new for the first time, try and leave assumptions at the door and get to know them on, on their merits on the basis of that initial con uh, initial conversation. Going meta over and over again, and by this it's it's more about looking at the bigger picture and trying to understand the bigger picture all the time, the, the bigger picture of culture, identity, etc. Understand your own biases and stereotypes and acknowledge them when they arise. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean acknowledging them when you're talking to other people, but it's 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 more about an internal acknowledgement. There might be situations where it's perfectly appropriate to acknowledge them with other people, but making sure that you acknowledge them and understand them yourself means that you can react to them. And it also helps to turn your autopilot off. Understand your own culture and associated preconceptions. And Jacob gave an example of uh, uh, Christmas and the Christmas in Denmark and what they do there. Uh, and every culture uh, across Europe will probably be slightly different and different in different ways and there will be different working cultures and for me in my time at Warwick and then other UK universities we worked a lot with universities on the uh, subcontinent the Indian subcontinent and as well in Africa and they had very different cultures around work the way they approach deadlines the way they got information to you their understandings of different concepts different words things that we we would just take for granted in a British context and possibly a European context. Uh, you know, respect individuals, but not culture. And by and by that, I mean, you can challenge people on their on the culture, but you just need to know when and how. But you need to understand that it is culture that that you're challenging as well, and trying to understand. So it's perfectly appropriate at times to question culture, to understand it, and to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, when it comes to making a, a decision about a project or whatever it might be. Challenge the stories you tell yourself about others. Um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll do this on your own, thinking about people, but also in group situations. You know, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about uh, when you talk about other people and other cultures and things like that? And, and let's be blunt, and it's, it's a bit uh, flippant, but you know, some people sometimes people are just idiots. I mean, they are. Um, the problem is recognizing when it's idiocy, when it's a cultural difference. And if you can turn your autopilot off and keep yourself thinking as broadly as possible, you would normally be able to pick up whether it's a cultural difference or whether somebody is just being an idiot. I, I talked earlier on about being a visible ally and calling out discrimination and making changes to policies, procedures, practice, whatever it might be. The really key part of that is the visible part. Um, you, you can be an ally that uh, doesn't openly challenge discrimination or doesn't openly validate uh, different minority groups within your team or your research partnership. And that's part of the story, but being visible actually provides reassurance to those people in that partnership or that team as well. And remember that all traditions and norms aren't necessarily rational or explainable, but they are things that you're obliged to do. And I did some work in China uh, 18 months ago, where I learned very quickly that when the head of the department takes you out to dinner with the whole department, 
when the head of the department decides that the evening is over, the evening is over. Um, you you all left. There wasn't scope to go on and have another drink, um, and that was uh, a, a cultural and traditional approach that they had, which coming from the UK didn't seem entirely rational, or, or perhaps you could explain it, um, but it was something that you were still obliged to do. As I said earlier, don't reduce people to one thing. Um, avoid focusing on one single cultural difference. And then thinking specifically about research now and researchers themselves and research partnerships. How can research management support researchers to design inclusive enough research to generate value and impact? And that's a question that in a longer workshop we'd, we'd work through with, with people, but we don't really have the time in this to go into, into in detail. But some of the things you might want to think about in terms of ground rules when setting up a research project and an, an international collaboration is to understand management styles, be clear about the way you handle disagreements within the project, the decision making processes, are they around a table in a meeting, is it via email, etc, etc, the positive and critical feedback mechanisms that you might use, uh, the methods of problem solving in the project and the autonomy that people will have within the project, including the freedom to choose methods to approach uh, solving problems or delivering the research. So those are some of the things that, that you can think about uh, when going into uh, these types of situations, meeting new people uh, in the research management, but also in international research collaborations. Uh, Jacob. There you go. Yeah, so finally, um, some questions apart from yeah, these tips and tricks, some questions you can ponder after this webinar. And one, of course, is to look at your office or the research group or the department you work in and then consider how diverse you are considering these per parameters, gender, race, nationality, sexual orientation, ability, age, etc. And remember, this is not a checklist. It's not like you have to suddenly realize, oh, we have too few women, we have no uh, LGBT persons, and you know, uh, we are all white, so next time you hire someone, it should be a black lesbian. I mean that's 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 of course not the 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 point of uh, the point of this. Um, just it is just to consider why if you're not diverse, why are you? Are you hiring too narrowly? Are you hiring what is familiar? It gives you that why not nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, have you built a culture that isn't welcoming to to minorities? Uh, if you're a leader. In a, in a leadership position, if nobody is out, and out here doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, as, a, as a gay person, but also isn't open, just consider it as open about their cultural background, that could be religion, etc. that might be a very important identity aspect of, of them, but they don't share at work. Are you a good leader then? What, sort, what kind of culture have you created either because people are not out or if you have uh, created a culture where you don't hire a, a diverse uh, group. Um, I won't go through all of them, uh, you can have a look at them afterwards, we will be sharing the slides of course. Um, except for the final question uh, that I think is highly relevant in, in these days is how does Zoom or Skype meetings impact diversity? Because they are obviously a very different kind of meetings and you can't uh, see people face to face uh, in the same way. The dynamics of who speaks is uh, often different. <clears throat> so can people be themselves and offer different perspectives if you have meetings like this, that? And I think that is especially important if you are perhaps working pre-award and you have to have your first meeting with a group who doesn't know each other about a proposal. How do you make sure that everybody feels comfortable and add their perspective to this from a personal identity uh, perspective and uh, don't feel afraid of coming out in one way or the other or being ridiculed? Uh, I think that is a 
I think it's hard enough as it is when we're meeting each other face to face. Doing it over Skype certainly doesn't make it uh, any easier. Great, thank you. So that's that's the main content of the presentation done. As I say, you, that, that probably feels like quite a rush and it's gone through quite a lot of different complex types of issues quite quickly. Um, a couple of things just to note on the on the final page. There are contact uh, details uh, for Jacob and myself. Um, we're both on Twitter. We are launching a podcast, the Diversity and Research podcast, which will hopefully, we're hoping in May will be the first episode. We've got the first I think, three episodes uh, lined up and we've got some interesting special guests coming on to talk about different issues as well. So do look out for that and, and we will certainly tweet about that and uh, let Iyama know as well and, and hopefully they might be able to promote it. Um, the other thing is we have alongside this which is a sort of beginning is, is normally sort of a four or five hour workshop where we can have much more discussion and, and do some activities together. There are a couple of other workshops that we have as well. One is primarily focused on new researchers in academia who are aspiring to take on leadership roles particularly in international collaboration. Uh, so we want to look at um, some to support them as, as they come through. Uh, and the other workshop is specifically for LGBT researchers or, or, or researchers who identify as LGBTQ+, uh, who want to uh, develop their career, understand how their identity plays a role in their research, uh, help them overcome challenges, uh, develop leadership skills and things like that. We, we have a workshop um, available for them as well. And we've got a few other blogs and things that we've uh, uh, written, which we can certainly circulate to people if they're interested. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm yes, Lachlan is muted now. Um, but I think uh, you, you finished up there and uh, let's let's go to some questions. Um, I, I um, noticed that Jacobs um, started or stopped by saying, what if um, if we would be doing this all, what is the, the influence of Zoom? And I think it would be brilliant brilliant now if you showed some, some red heels, because that could be, of course, uh, one of the things that is different. You could be wearing them right now while there would be no uh, such perception as usual so it might be a good thing a bad thing i leave it uh, i leave it to you there okay okay yeah that's boring but uh, yeah okay thank you <laughs> um please guys you you can both um, unmute yourself to start um answering uh the questions um i'll uh, go immediately to the questions that people have posed and maybe come back with a few uh for myself um later on uh, first off some 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 nice comments great eye opener session thanks a lot and um also there was another nice comment that just moved down but i go to the question of oscar uh, van vliet so if somebody comes out on red heels or in a more subtle way, how can I be surprised and need to adapt my perception of them, but avoid being offensive? I don't want to make them feel like I don't fit in, like they don't fit in, but my perceived uh, world has just changed and I need to process that. Can I just exactly say that? Or is it better to make a possibly bad joke? <laughs> Well, uh, from my perspective, I think you can just say that. Uh, that's better than a bad joke, uh, mm -hmm. definitely. I, I think it's um, being honest with that, with that person. I mean, having that one-to-one -one conversation with that person. One of, the, one of the things that sometimes works very well is, is, is if you're sitting down with that individual and thanking them for, for coming out, you can say that, you know, this is a new thing for you. That's totally fine and you want to process that. But you can also share a vulnerability of yourself, like um, if you've had some other experience where, you know, you remember you had to tell your boss X and that was difficult or something like that. You can just help create a sense of empathy and make that person feel uh, comfortable in that process. But I, I, yeah, avoid the bad jokes. I would definitely avoid the bad jokes. But I think yeah. you could be quite open about that. I, I don't know if Jacob has a, a view on that. No, I, I completely agree with that. And by avoiding the bad joke, I will also avoid doing a good joke. Yeah. I suppose. Well, yeah. So Obviously. that we have to that we have to take into account, and also there will be no 
no good jokes in that regard and some some people uh, can't help it of course um that's also myself something that i would be wondering indeed is is humor a good way to go there because i think it's either if it, in in a situation it might be humor or sort of avoidance and shutting down and maybe that wouldn't also be um, a nice thing because this this question would come down to me saying um hey um this is something new for me or strange for me um uh, so just apologize me at this moment for maybe doing something that I normally wouldn't be doing or being outside of my comfort zone, which I think in a sort of, because you're meeting somebody, you want to make a good impression and probably that that also wouldn't flow very, I, I cannot understand that, that that would be something uh, something acceptable, but would it be sort of in an opener or in somebody you, you've met a couple of hours and then um, uh, you come into that situation? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it would, would flow well, I think if I just, if I said that, yeah. I would say, I "Oh, your I, red heels." I, I can't process that at the moment. It's new to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I just met you. That way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, acknowledging that it's something different is, I think, absolutely fine. I mean, for me, and and everybody will have their own take on this. I think for me, humor is absolutely fine. But I find humor much more, uh, much more relatable, much more understandable if I know the person quite well. Mm. Um, if it's somebody who I've never met or only just met, it can be a little bit jarring because because you're trying to make an assessment on them as well. And if you know the person well and you know their humour, it can be okay. Um, but I think what you just described, Nick, is is fine. I think mm. the, the type of approach you just described is fine. The thing to remember is that the problem with humour is that the minority person you are speaking to is often in a position of vulnerability. And it, it can be difficult to always assess whether it, it is a joke or if you're being ridiculed. So humor is too often, there's a too, often too big a risk for misunderstanding and uh, that could lead to a conflict or something, one being hurt. So I do understand the idea of trying to deflect the intensity of the situation through humor but the, the risks are a bit higher so it's better to acknowledge and appreciate them coming out in one way or the other and being honest about your how you think about it yeah so opening with humor risky but while you were saying all of this i was also thinking well if i meet somebody and they make a bad joke Mm. Um, in whatever way, it's always going to be a bad first impression. So it yeah. might be a bit worse in this situation, but in general, it's just, uh, yeah. yeah. If you insult somebody when you first meet them, it's always going to be a bad, a bad yeah. opener, I suppose. Um, I move to uh, the question of, of Esther Phillips um, on the outcome. Uh, Jacob said that some people only want to be judged by their merits. And this is a reason not to come out. But wouldn't the diversity in the broad sense actually add value to a team because of the diversity on views and perspectives? Sure, it would. But that would, of course, require that we, especially in academia, had a very different notion of excellence and merits. As long as we basically only judge people on publications and how much money they can uh, gain, um, then we have a very narrow definition of um, of, um, of of excellence and 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 what merits are, and I think that is hurting. Also, in the organisations, what do you value? You might have a, a lot of nice policies, but if you don't promote people who uh, try something new and take risks and only ha or have a very uh, traditional idea of marriage you will continue to reproduce the current power structures uh, over and over again so yes she's absolutely right that would be the ideal world it's just not the world that we are living in uh, right now yeah yeah indeed also from the management's perspective because we are dealing with this from a bit of a different angle although in a sense also the same angle often for the recognition of the rma profession we're looking at how will policymakers, managers yeah. um uh, how will they look at 
um, at things. And often we try to get sort of the narrow angle of sort of the financial gain, which mm -hmm. is often the one we arrive at most, but which is in a lot of cases. And we're mostly talking often short-term financial game. So we have a research manager and administrator. So um, if they're trained well, it will you'll get more funding, it will be more efficient and so on. While in this case, uh, as, as we were discussing, um, if you have a diverse team, it will be more productive. So financially, um, and there, of course, you have the short-term and the long-term benefit. While I think it is, um, it's a much broader discussion um, than that. So um, indeed, yeah. although it, with being a policy maker and manager under pressure, often that is a very appealing thing, I think, but mm -hmm. we need to make the conversation much broader. And this session is, is, is very interesting in that way to, to be thinking about all elements and also uh, from this direction. Yeah. Um, and then of course it just takes time. I mean, it's difficult to make it work when pe people are different. It's more difficult. You need to develop new cultures and stuff like that. So in that sense, it's a lot easier to keep going. And that is also why we still have to defend diversity and make a case for it, which is obviously strange because the world is diverse. It should be the opposite. I mean, white cisgendered heterosexual men in power should basically be defending why the current systems should continue and why everybody else should have no part of, of power and resources. Um, question from the ERMA side. We are always uh, very much, as I said, we are um, very committed to um, diversities, uh, diversity in all ways. And one of the elements there is that we look at something we might have failed at today to make sure that we uh, we think about do we have enough, um, do we have uh, male, female in a lot of cases for ERMA then because we are and the RMA profession predominantly female. Um, how do you look at sort of all male panels, all female panels, for example, but we then have the male female area. You, you mentioned it shortly, but um, is this uh, something Yarma should be looking at? We are uh, definitely uh, looking at it, uh, although we might have failed in it today in a sense because we are all wild white male men but then again that is a, a bit of a, a superficial thing uh, because there are, are differences in a sense between us in, 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 in the, the topics we've discussed today also um, is that something we should be looking into that into that and what sort of advice do you have how we balance this or sh we shouldn't look? yeah just your opinion on, on, on um, um, the makeup of, of panels in, in a diverse way I, th I, I think, think if, they should. Uh, sorry, you go ahead. No, I, was just say, I think if you <clears throat> don't tackle it, um, I, you can certainly see on things like Twitter, you'll get called out all the time, won't you? I mean, it happens all the time. It, it certainly, I mean, it's, it's good to know that you're conscious of it. Um, and most organizations, I think, are. I think um, so sometimes this comes back down to visible and invisible differences as well. I mean, gender is incredibly important. I mean, don't get me wrong, it is absolutely incredibly important. But there will be people sometimes who are sitting on panels who might have invisible differences and can actually speak from that. So it's about really understanding who it is that you're inviting, uh, what their expertise is, what their angle is. Um, and, and, and for that, it's about learning. Uh, well, not 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 taking recommendations from the same places, I guess, all the time to find people to to talk about different things. Uh, that's that's my first reaction on that, Jacob. Yeah, and that's also I think it's of course a a the responsibility of the organisation, but it is also re the responsibility of the people who are invited to be on panels that you say that I will not be part as a man that I will I'll not be part of a manal, uh, an all male panel and, and stuff like that. Yet you also as a participant, as a participant insist that uh, it should be diverse. And because that's the only way we'll get to a point where it doesn't matter. I think, uh, the best illustration of this is, I think uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was uh, asked how many women should be on the U.S. Supreme Court uh, on, uh, before she thought it was enough. Should it be four? Should it be five? And she answered nine. Because for many, many years, we didn't consider it a problem that nine men represented uh, everybody in this country. So we won't have equal opportunities until the day that we don't consider it a problem that nine women represents everybody. Mm. Uh, yeah, and each, each um, 
environment is different. And so we, we've written a blog post, which went out about a month ago, where we talked about challenging who, who's allowed to talk about diversity in different situations. So, you know, for me as a gay man playing cricket, and for those who don't know what cricket is, it's a very quintessentially English summertime sport, um, but gay men don't play it. I'm one of a handful, it seems, in, in England, you know, to have a voice in that, that environment is seen as legitimate, even though I'm cisgendered, uh, white male, um, it's seen as legitimate um, in, in different situations and sometimes seen as not legitimate. So um, I think the point that Jacob made around the Supreme Court is, is really interesting in that respect. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, uh, the courses that you speak about, are they only available to researchers at your university? I think that's a, a misconception there. <laughs> or uh, can we find them, uh, can we find information regarding these somewhere? Uh, yes, so the we have information live available now for this workshop or this webinar workshop, the longer version. And in the next week, we will have uh, if information distributed on the other two workshops that we talked about and they're available to any university or group of universities it doesn't have to be a single university it could be a group um, they'll be on the diversity unity website uh, eventually they'll be on the cloud chamber website but we're just about to redesign it so it might take a few weeks um, but we'll send it out via twitter and linkedin and things like that as well or, okay. or just get in touch yeah, I think indeed the, 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 the answer here is also to get in touch with the details that uh, that uh, Jacob and Lachland um, uh, released and, and the presentation will be uh, online, I'm supposing. I don't know if the agreement was given for that, but I probably, um, I yeah. think it, it will be it will be online. Uh, final question. Uh, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I have a question about different dimensions of diversity. How do you deal with conflicts between different minority groups. Can there be a priority given to one or the other dimension? How could that be justified? That's, that, yeah, that's a difficult question. So how, 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 man, how many hours do we have left? Uh, well, it depends. You could say as a rule of a different way, it depends a bit on what's going on and why. So I don't think there's an, an easy answer there. I think the as a rule of thumb, if it's a question about cultural identities as international uh, identities and in national uh, cultural backgrounds, a rule of thumb is the norms of the host country are the, the norms you follow. I mean, when in Rome is always a, 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 a good, uh, good way of, 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 of doing this. When you have different conflicts between minority groups i think it is then we're back as we talk about it is a question about going meta and it is a question of asking questions you can all i mean and it's also knowing your own culture as we talked about earlier knowing what is important when when to pick a fight and when to be pragmatic and sometimes of course you can say we have to put a foot down because this is unacceptable but if you don't, it's always a question of asking, why do you have these thoughts about these other people? What are the background for this? Ask and ask and ask once more until you get to the, to the root of this. And then it's all the cultural intelligent thing would always be to find a completely new solution that everybody could uh, live with. That is the, the situation where everybody feels recognized in this situation. The moment you compromise, there's always someone who would feel like a winner or a loser. And most times, both, both parties would feel like uh, the loser. And that really becomes difficult. But it, but it is a challenge and it probably won't solve it immediately. And that is the whole problem of this, of course. This is difficult. I mean, as soon as you involve human beings, things become <laughs> becomes difficult. <laughs> um, so it will lead to probably to begin with lead to some conflict. But I think it is a question that you need about learning to take time to solve conflicts. We are too often do many to do too many things to deflect and avoid conflict, um, pre and pretending it never happened. Then it's all good, and it's not. 
Okay, thank you. We'll end, uh, we'll end on that uh, thought for the session. Thank you so much, uh, Jakob and Lachlan, uh, for your insights into this. Thank you, uh, viewers, for uh, being with us today. Um, we have our final session coming up tomorrow, and it is an interesting one on the implementation of Horizon Europe with the director of the Common Implementation um, Center at DGRTD, um, Anna Panagopoulou. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, Yarma is looking, of course, in these strange times. Um, um, we've now put on eight um, uh, sessions, so uh, seven, which were open to everyone um, in what we can do online, how we can uh, serve our members the best uh, possible way in these times. Uh, we will be evaluating, obviously, these digital sessions and seeing how we can add that. I think it is clear that in the future we want more of this we want more webinars we want more online content but in which exact form uh, we will be uh, we will be discussing internally and i do invite everybody who has a warm heart for karma to uh, contribute to future sessions and also to the thought process of how we should uh, do that and, uh, and 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 as i said contribute to it. So um, thank you so much uh, again, Lachlan and Jakob. Um, I wish you all a, a very nice day and I hope to see um, some of you or all of you tomorrow at uh, 1400 hours for the next session. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.